I'm getting like a little, sounds, sounds funny, sounds tinny. Take some high off. Praise the Lord. Amen. That's better. Yeah, that's good. Praise God. I want to welcome those who are watching by Facebook tonight. God bless you. We're glad that you could join us. And um, we're having a, a Bible study on, how, on healing damaged emotions. And uh, God bless you. How many of us are being blessed by this study? Is it, is it causing you to get free? Is it cause, it's causing you to look at yourself? And, and, and if there's any areas where this applies, that you apply it to so that God can heal you, so that you can move forward and, and grow. You know, what happens a lot of times is sometimes you reach a plateau in Christianity. I've been saved for 40 years. <clears throat> and it, sometimes you, you think you get to a place where you don't need to grow anymore, but you still need to grow. We still need to develop. We still need to turn over things to God. And, and sometimes... God allows things to happen or brings things into pass so that we can see where we really are emotionally. And sometimes we don't get healed because we don't, we don't actually apply or we don't actually know that sometimes these things are really hindering our growth. And so um, tonight I want to share with you about abandonment. And Linda's eyes just got big. She's uh, on the way home last week. She says, yeah, I'm not going to Bible study next week. Uh, and I, she, I said, why? She said, because you're going to be speaking on abandonment. And she told me why. And, and, and we're going to pray that God will heal that little hurt that she has in her heart. Uh, abandonment means being left or uh, someone who leaves you or something happens and you feel these feelings and these emotions of uh, being lonely or being forgotten. And that can, that can transpire in many, many ways. Uh, that can transpire through uh, parents. That can transpire through a, a loved one. It can transpire through your children. It can transpire through your husband or your wife. Um, especially, especially if there are needs that are not being met, even in the marriage. Because there are emotional needs sometimes that are needed in the marriage. And sometimes men don't know how to express themselves to their wives in an emotional way and, and be able to uh, deal with emotional things. They just, you know, ah, you don't know. But you, and, you, and, you, and what happens is sometimes is that a person can feel abandoned when you don't have that support. You don't have that kind of, of uh, interaction, if you will. The husband just goes out, makes the money, comes home, feeds feeds his face, sits on the couch, uh, rather than, you know, you know, interacting and finding out why, you know, there are problems or why there's things that are going on in the house. Um, sometimes we may feel at times like we've been abandoned. Sometimes there's, there's a real legitimate abandonment that takes place emotionally, physically, mentally, even spiritually. Sometimes we think God has abandoned us. You know, when you, uh, answer, you, when you ask God for something and you're praying about something and you're praying and you're praying and you're fasting and you're believing and you're going through all of these things and yet it seems that the outcome of what you've been praying is totally the opposite of what has happened as you're praying. And so sometimes you feel like, God, you know, didn't you hear me? Did, did you leave me or something? Did, what's going on? How come these things happen? So the first scripture I want to share tonight with you is from Lamentations, uh, chapter 5, going with verse 19 and 22. Now, I, I've heard different things about people saying, well, you know, you don't need to preach about psychology or counseling or all that. But you know something? I, I kind of disagree with that. And I'll tell you why. Could you just um, re reposition that for me? Um, because a lot of times people... You can give them scripture and scripture and scripture. People can hear scripture for years. You can teach and preach the Bible for years. But if these things are really hindering people in their emotions and things like that, they're not going to grow in those areas. They're going to be stunted in, that, in their growth. And so I believe that if you take the things of God and you use, you know, the, like the Bible says, in the multitude of counselors, there's much wisdom. And that's not only counseling for direction or counseling uh, for the word of God. 
But that's counseling to help you grow as a pastor. It's my responsibility to help you grow as Christians. I'm going to give you one example before I read the scripture uh, in Lamentations. So don't, don't put it up there yet. Just take it off. Um, I, I just want to say that someone approached me Sunday and said, you know what? The church is a loving church. However, nobody interacts with each other during the week. Nobody calls. Nobody invites us over. Nobody interacts with us. And that's the truth. We, don't, we, we just come on Wednesday, Mondays, and, and, and Sundays. and we, I mean, I have interaction with different people. But I mean, the body needs to do that. Well, pastor, you know, I'm real busy. Well, you need to kind of prioritize a little bit because, you know, people might leave. Because they're not, they, you know, people that are going through things, nobody calls. Nobody calls to say, hey, are you okay? You know, is, is it all right? You know, can, can I come out for coffee? Just, just even if you spend 20 minutes with them. And, you know, if that's the kind of church, that's not the church of Jesus Christ. That's, I'm sorry. That's not a biblical church. If a church has just come on Wednesday, just come on Monday, just be involved on, on Sunday, that's, that's not the body of Christ. That's just religion. Not caring about your, your brother or your sister and just all to yourself and all about your life and all about what you're doing, then we're, we're, we're making a big mistake because there's people that are in this church that are hurting and they need to have interaction. More so, not only from the pastor, but from you because we're brothers and sisters. You know, like the Bible says, bear ye one another's burdens. You know, we, the only way you can do that is if you're interacting with people, but we're so busy with our own schedules and doing what we, and I understand we work, and I understand we do all those things, but we need to be more of a living organiz, organism rather than just an organization of coming together on Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. Um, so that's something that you need to really work on. That's an area this church needs to work on, is being more sensitive when you don't see somebody here on Sunday morning you, or Wednesday night or Monday night, you need to pick up the phone. I do. You need to pick up the phone. They don't want to just hear from me you know, because they, they say, well, that's your job. You're supposed to. Yeah, okay, I do that. But what about you? What about you caring for your brother? You know, we get the, the mentality of, of, uh, of Cain. Am I my brother's keeper? Yeah, you are. <laughs> and I am too, right? Do I get an amen because I'm getting very silent here and quiet? But, you know, this is the truth of, these are some of the emotional things that we need to work on, too, and be a living organism and, and being reaching out. And that's why, maybe that's why one of the reasons why we're not growing. God's not going to add to more of what we're doing when we're not doing what's, what's right. We're not living the Christian life as far as reaching out and caring for our brothers and sisters. Amen? Okay. So we're going to talk about how we may feel at times as far as being abandoned, because some people are feeling that way this church. We only get together on Monday, Wednesday, Friday, and so that's uh, Monday, Wednesday, and Sunday, and then Friday's on Women's Fellowship, and that's about it. But uh, again, there needs to be an interaction because, you know, what's going to happen in these last days if all of our rights get taken away? And we're going to need to depend upon one another. You know, we can't be so inclusive of just our clique of, of who we, uh, hang, who we are, uh, of our family that we don't bother with other Christians can't do that. So anyway, Lamentations, chapter 5. Put it up there. You got the reference, 19? Uh, use the NLT for me, please. But Lord, you remain the same forever. Your throne continues from generation to generation. That's verse 19, right? Okay. Continue. Why do you continue to forget us? Here Jeremiah is writing the book of Lamentations, and he's crying out to God, and he's saying, why do you continue to forget us? Now, sometimes that's how we feel if we're honest. I don't care who you are. I don't care what great preacher you are. I don't care what minister you are. I don't care how big your ministry is. There are times when you go through and you feel like God has forgotten you. Anyone here ever feel that way? Come on. Be honest. No? You never, you never, you, 
But you never, you never think God forgets you when you're praying for your sister or you're praying for your son and nothing happens? I didn't say for a long time. I said, have you ever felt that way? Yes, you have, if you're really truthful and honest. Everybody has felt that way at one time or another. Okay? God, you know, even if you, you know that it's only for a fleeting moment that you feel that way, but yet those feelings and those emotions still come out. See, what happens, a lot of people, they try to suppress their feelings and suppress their, their think, and they think that that's okay. No, it's not, because eventually it's going to come out one way or another. So that's why sometimes it's good to let those things out. Just talk, to, talk about those things. And so and look at Jeremiah. He was a prophet of God. Okay? He was called of God. He was known as the weeping prophet. He would weep over Israel and Judah. He would weep over the children of God. And yet here he comes out and he says, why do you continue to forget us, God? When you've prayed and prayed and prayed and nothing has happened, nothing has changed. Okay? Sometimes you can say that in your mind or in your heart. God, have you forgotten us? You are, sometimes it's phrased this way, God, where are you? It's the same thing. It's only, the only semantics, it's only, you're only changing words, but it means exactly the same. Says, Why do you continue to forget us? Now, number one, if you really know the character of God, how can God forget? God can't forget. So it's an emotional outburst. It's an emotional feeling of distress or whatever it is that you're feeling during that time you're going out. And I believe that God honors honesty. I believe that God honors that when you are honest with him and you say, you know what, God, I feel this way. I feel like you've forgotten me. Have you ever felt that way before you were a Christian? Have you ever felt that way when you're, when, when you're going to play a sport or something and you're the last one picked? Okay, Or maybe you're not picked at all. Or someone picks or gives something to someone else that you felt that maybe you should have got. Or there was a job that you applied for that you really, really wanted, and you didn't get that job, somebody else got that job. He says, why do you continue to forget us? God didn't forget him. No way did God forget him. But our emotions and our feelings, sometimes we feel like God has forgotten. Some of you that are watching by Facebook, you may have been going through some things in your life, and at times you have felt like God has forgotten you. Can I tell you, that's not part of the character and the makeup of God. God can't forget. Okay. When he says he forgets our sins and throws them in the sea of forgetfulness, yeah, but he still knows where they are. But it's a metaphorical expression to let you know that he's not counting it against us. Why have you abandoned us for so long? And it's like Jeanette said, not, it didn't, he didn't really abandon them. But understand when Israel was sinning against God, okay? When Israel was against God and wasn't doing the covenants of God, wasn't keeping the commandments of God, God moved back his presence. God took the ark when they, when the ark, when they were just looking at the ark as a superstition. What did God do? He allowed the enemy to come and take it over. Because they, they said, oh, as long as we have the ark, we're safe. No. It wasn't the ark, per se. It was the presence of God. But they made the ark the idol. And so what happened is they came in, and the enemy came in, took the ark, and then when the enemy got it, it was a curse to them, so they got rid of it. And then they went to Obed-Edom's house, and it was a blessing. Why? Because their heart was right. Why have you abandoned us for so long? When all the time is they've abandoned God. They moved away from God. They moved away from the covenants. They moved away from the things that God had said. And that's what happens to you and I emotionally when we, don't, when we trust our emotions and our feelings above the truth. See, we talked about that. God's word is truth. And so God's word is what we have to stand on, not our feelings, not our emotions. Because those emotions and those feelings are fleeting. 
You know, for that one moment, you're going to say, oh, you know, God, why have you forsaken me? But other than that, you, you know God hasn't forsaken you. But can I tell you, even Jesus felt abandoned. Some, some of you are looking at me strange. When Jesus was on the cross, What did he cry? My God, my God, why hast thou abandoned me? Oh, in the King James says forsaken, but in the other translations it says abandoned. You've left me. I'm alone. God didn't abandon him because he didn't love him. He didn't leave Jesus because he didn't love him. He left Jesus because he could not look upon sin. And it says Christ took the sin of the world upon himself. And that's why God turned away. It had nothing to do with him loving Jesus or not. He says, why have you, been, uh, why have you abandoned us for so long? In other words, he went through these feelings and these emotions for quite a while. And then he goes on, he says, why do you always forget us? Why do you forsake us so long? Next verse. Okay, you got it? Okay. Then he says, Restore us to yourself, Lord, that we may return. Renew our days as of old, unless you have utterly rejected us and are angry with us beyond measure. Now understand, you have to look at, them, you have to look at their mentality of what they were thinking at the time. How did God deal with sin back then? Ba-boom, bang, okay? God would, would destroy. God would kill. God would eliminate. That's how God did it. And you, you begin to see how God dealt with Nathan and, and uh, uh, Korah and all these people that sinned against him, right? And you see God do some things like that, man. You, you'd be kind of wondering, you know? <laughs> There may be times when you feel abandoned or forsaken. Sometimes, apart from your relationship with God, I'm talking about relationship with people. Your father, mother, sister, brother, uncle, aunties, mom's dad, boyfriend, girlfriend, husband, wife. And that can happen even as a child. Um, it can have a, a it can have a really devastating effect on people's emotions and their outlook on things. So I want to play a short clip. It's about a minute long. I just want you to watch this clip, and uh, if you can just dim the light a little bit and turn up the volume. Start it over. The volume's not on. When I was in third grade, my dad came to my private school and someone told me, your dad is here to pick you up. He walked in, he told the teacher, I'm here to pick up my daughter. I was thinking I should start gathering my things and I saw his girlfriend's daughter um, gather her things and he told her to come on and, and they left the classroom. and. I felt so small, I felt lonely, I felt embarrassed, I felt replaced. I think it kind of made me feel less than. I believe I have a fear of being abandoned. I feel like even when people are nice to me, it's not really how they really feel and I'm always waiting for the way they really feel. I'm always waiting for the way they really feel to come out. 
And for them to decide they don't want to have anything to do with me. Those are real feelings and, and real emotions that happen. Think about that. Here she's in class. Her, her dad comes in, apparently separated from her mother, has a girlfriend, has a daughter that's not his real daughter, and comes in and says, I'm, I'm here to pick up my daughter. And here she's excited. Okay, daddy's going to pick me up. I'm going to have some time with my dad. And then the, the girl, girlfriend's daughter packs up her stuff and goes with him. Uh, that's, that's a scar that this woman now is dealing with as an adult. Okay, that happened when she was, I guess, six or seven or whatever it was. Um, but uh, the, the emotion is real, the hurt is real when your father or your mother uh, do those things. And, and you know what? There was things that my dad did. My dad wasn't there for me emotionally. He was there to provide, which he did. He was a good provider for me. Okay, he was there for that. But he was not there for me emotionally. He wasn't there to guide me and to, and to instruct me and what to do. All he did was, you know, tell me, you, you do this and you do that, and you come home at this time and you do that and you do all that. But he was never really that example to me. I don't blame him because he only had a sixth grade education. He didn't know any better. He didn't know what it was. His father died when he was like six or seven himself. So he didn't have a father figure. And it didn't really come into my life the same way. I never knew my grandparents. You know, and I was just saying, Lord, I've been robbed. I never had to have a relationship with my grandparents like so many of you have your grand have, have had your grandparents. You know, and uh, some of you didn't even have your parents. You know, and that is, that's, that's some things that are really, really, really hurtful when they're not there for you. And, and the thing that I learned out of it and the things that I want to pass on to you is that it's not your fault. It wasn't you. There's nothing wrong with you. It was them. They didn't live up to the responsibility and the accountability that, that having a child was meant to be. They just didn't live up to that responsibility. Now, some of us had good parents, some of us had bad parents. Some of us had great parents, some not so great. Okay. And so these are things that you have to deal with, you know. And uh, one of the things um, that really was um, a painful thing for, for my wife, can I share that? No? Okay, I'm not going to share it because I want you to. Well, you should because you need healing from it. need to be healed from that. Maybe um, someone can come give us mama a hug. See, Linda, Linda denies, 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 and then, she, and then she gets healed. It just takes a little while. But it was, it was something that happened in her family. But, um, you know, it, it always, it always, always um, needs, that needs to be healed. If it's not healed, it'll block. It'll cause a blockage because it involves another person, and that person has to be forgiven, and so forth, and all that stuff. So I'll just leave it there. But again, there, there, you can see the stronghold that has happened. I told you when I started this course, it's going to cause a, a flight or fight. Okay, and and you need to fight that, and you need to not want to run away from these things or not face these things. And when I say run, I'm not talking about literally running out of the building. I'm talking about running away from admitting these things and dealing with these issues. Because if you don't deal with these issues, it's going to be a problem. And it always will be a problem. There will always be that blockage somewhere. Somewhere down the line you'll be going, you know, why am I feeling this way? Why is this happening? You know, how can I get over this? And so um, maybe one day Linda will share that with you at the woman's meeting or something. I don't know. But um, again, I'm sure that there's someone here and someone we're watching that have those issues, that they feel that they were abandoned either by either parent or something that took place or they were never really there to bring that instruction to you or to bring that healing to you. And um, 
I, I just want to take a moment, if we can, before I, before I go on. If there is anyone else that feels that way, you feel like there were some things in, in your life, whether it be your mom or your dad or your brother or sister or somebody let you down, I want you to stand up. I want you to come forward. I want you to come to the altar. God's going to heal you tonight. And I don't want to know what that thing is. It's none of my business. But I just want you to confess it to God. And I want you to just say this prayer. Say, God, I'm here. And you know why I'm here. I confess to you, Lord, that it was not right for me to hold these feelings and these emotions. And I ask you to forgive me. And I renounce the enemy and his lies of those things that were spoken over me, of how I felt with my feelings, and those feelings that were deceptive and deceiving me into thinking things that may or may not have been true. I release those people. I want you to name them individually of whatever the situation was in your life. Lord, I forgive them. And I thank you now that I'm free and I'm released. And I tell the enemy, I shut that door of that emotion in my life, never to be opened again. And I thank you, Lord, for healing me, for loving me, for accepting me. And I know that you will never abandon me. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Just take a moment, sit down, and let the Holy Spirit speak to you now. Let him speak to your heart right now. Just be quiet for a moment. Sit down. And let the Lord just bring that total healing into your body your person. It's not it's not hard, it's not difficult. It's very easy. It's very simple. Listen to the Holy Spirit speaking to your heart right now. saying to you. What did the Holy Spirit just say to you? Look at his love. You're a new creation in Christ Jesus. You are. And you're fearfully and wonderfully made. What does the Lord speak to your heart? Who else? Anyone else? 
What did the Lord just speak to you as you were quietly waiting on Him? He wants to speak. Don't think it's just you. The Holy Spirit speaks to you. Anyone else? If that's right. That's the Holy Spirit. Let it go. Sometimes it's difficult, you know. It is. But you need to let it go. Because you're a new creation. You're not the old person anymore that holds grudges and defiance hatred and bitterness and, and remember we talked about all those things and unforgiveness and you're a new creation let it go what else is God saying tonight how about you sister Edie has the Lord spoken anything to you while you're being quiet, listening to him. You, Tara, what did, what did God speak to you, Tara? Huh? Turning from the past and moving forward? You're a new creation. Let it go. Turning from the past. Amen. That's right. Turning from the past so that you can have a future. All right, well, let's continue. Philippians 2.13 says this. For God is working in you, giving you the desire and the power to do what pleases God. God is working in you and giving you the desire and the power to do what pleases Him. There's the difference between trying to please God in the flesh. And the Bible says, no flesh shall glory in His presence. Your flesh can't please God. The Bible says that. They that are in the flesh cannot please God. Can't. It is God who is working in you and giving you the desire and the power to do what pleases Him. Can I tell you, what you did tonight pleases God. Letting go, because you're a new creation, turning from the past, and going forward. Those are the things that we need. We cannot change the past. We can't change what happened. We can't change the direction that people have gone. None of that. You cannot control any of that. But what you can do is you can be different now. 
Amen? You may have times in your life when it seems that he has, God, has forsaken you. But he will never, hear me now, he'll never forsake you. Isaiah 49, verse 15 and 16 says this. Never can a mother forget her nursing child. Can she feel no love for the child she has born? But even if that were possible, I would not forget you. See, I have written you. I've written your name on the palms of my hands. Always in my mind is a picture of Jerusalem's walls in ruin. In other words, he sees the calamity that his people have gone through. And he says, like Israel, you have, even Jesus talks about that. You know, None of them shall be plucked out of my hand. That God's, you're in God's hands. He loves you. And he cares for you. Psalm 27, verse 10. This is a scripture. Don't put it up right now, but this is a scripture. You can just block it out for now. Um, this is a scripture when uh, I went through a real time when I lost my, uh, my mom. My mom died in, I believe it was 91, 92. My brother died in 1990, was it seven or eight? Around there. You have it written down? Linda always, she's good that way, you know. It was 97. My brother passed away in 97 at 50, 50 something years old. 52, I think it was, 53. So within a short spirit, with a short sphere of time, my mother passed away, and I was very close to my mom, more so than my dad, because my mom was always around. My dad was had two jobs, worked hard. Like I said, was a great provider, but not one emotionally and you know directive directive wise. And so my mother died, my brother died, and a year after my brother died, my father died. And I conducted all three funerals. And it was difficult. And it was very hard for me. Um, because now you, you're all alone. You know, you don't have any more. All my relatives are slowly dying off, and they have died. And I've lost uncles and aunts and I don't know about cousins. Any, any cousin? Yes, I did. My cousin, my cousin Hank from Connecticut, and um, and when you know go, after going through this loss, I was um, having my devotion one morning, and the Lord gave me this particular scripture, and it really, really ministered to my heart. Uh, it says, "Even if my father and mother abandon me, the Lord will hold me close." And that just really, really ministered to me and really kept me, you know. And uh, I just broke down and, and wept before the Lord. And I said, Lord, thank you. Um, I think it's the King James says, when your father and mother forsake you or leave you, I will, I will be with you. Put that on the King James for me for a minute. Because when my father and my mother forsake me, the Lord will take me up. He'll take me up, you know, like put me on your lap, you know. And that's what God did, really. He took me up and he took, like he says, I won't forsake you, I'll, I'll, I'll be with you. And um, always remember that when you go through things in life, when you go through disappointments, when you go through that, your father or mother forsake you or they leave you, the Lord will take you up. And he will keep you and he will strengthen you. 
and he will be your mom and your dad for the rest of your life. And you know what's great about things? Is that God puts people in your life. Amen. God puts people in your life. Like he, he, he put missionaries in our life. He put older Christians in our life, Linda and I, and that we became good friends with. And brothers and sisters like you guys, you know, and, and even like daughters, you know. I call you my daughters and stuff like that uh, because um, that's what we are. We're, 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 we're related. We're, we're, we have a close-knit love for one another. In, in this church, but I want to see it more so among, not just with Linda and I, but also among each other, you know, reaching out to each other. That's what the Christian life is all about, is reaching out. You know, the meaning of joy is Jesus, others, and you, J-O-Y. Jesus, others, and you. Putting others before yourself. And, uh, and I believe that we need to do that. If we're going to truly be a loving church and people are going to see that we're a loving church, that we don't interact with each other. So again, the Lord will take us up when we feel forsaken, when we feel like we're alone. Many of us are going to go through difficult trials, difficult things. You know, especially those who have lost a parent, and the other parent's getting older, and, and you know they're living they're living their life. Um, you know, like like Jen, she didn't expect her mom to to die. She expected to go there and see her mom, and and you know, and be with her mom. And then she gets a phone call, oh, your mother's in the hospital and she's not doing well. You've got to get here right away and gets there and she, di she dies. So again, you know, we take things for granted, but we can't because you never know. You know, I always say this, my time and seasons are in God's hands. And so when my time comes, God knows when that time is. <clears throat> I don't want people to get all weepy-eyed over me. I'm in a better place. Okay, you're just weeping for yourself because you're going to miss me, maybe. Praise God. All right. Okay, sorry. Psalm, verse 9, 10 and 11 says this, Those who know your name will trust you, for you have, for, oh, I'm sorry, for you have not forsaken those seek you. Lord, sing praises to the Lord who dwells on Zion, declares his mighty deeds among the people. Sing praises to the Lord who reigns in Jerusalem, tell the world about his unforgettable deeds. One of the ways to get out of some of those feelings is to share. Is to go and talk about the things of God. Talk about how God has done things in your life. How he's been faithful to you how he's never left you nor forsaken you, how in those other times and moments when you went through something in your life, God was there. You know, you turned the radio on and there was a song that ministered to you or you went somewhere and someone that you hadn't seen in a long time was there and they were Christian and they spoke something to you that, that ministered to you. Those are God divine, God's divine appointments for you. And, you know, you need to ask God for those. Ask God. Say, God, give me divine appointments. That I can speak to somebody or somebody can speak to me. Uh, maybe they have an answer for you. Maybe they have something that God wants to share with you, with them, uh, through them, rather. Psalm 37, verse 28. Indeed, the Lord loves justice, and he will not abandon his godliness. The Lord loves justice, and he will never that's why I like the NLT. He will never abandon the God. He will keep them safe forever, but the children of the wicked will die. When you die, when it talks about death here, it talks about separation from him. When God told Adam in the, in the garden, if you eat of that tree, the day that you eat, you're going to die. He didn't die physically. It was a spiritual death that took place. Was, but that death was a separation. Okay? It was a separation. His spirit was now separated from God. That's why God said, where are you? It was that he felt that separation. It's not that God didn't know where Adam was because he was all-knowing. Of course, we understand that. Psalm 30, uh, let's see. 
We talked a little bit about this before. Jesus felt abandoned. Mark 15, 34. Then at 3 o'clock, Jesus called out with a loud voice, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani, which means, my God, my God, why have you abandoned me? And I was thinking about this today as I was reading this and going over these notes. I was, re I, was, I was thinking about this, and I just sat there and began to weep, and I said, Lord, you went through abandonment. You went through the most loneliest, the greatest loneliness that any person could ever feel, more so than any other human being could feel loneliness. Think about this. The whole sin of all the world, that wasn't only in his time, during, you know, A.D. 30 or whatever it was, but that was throughout all of history, past, present, and future of the sins of the world, he took those sins upon himself. And because of that, God is, is holy. That The Bible says he's so holy that he cannot look upon sin. So when that happened, he had to turn away. When he saw his son dying on that cross because the wages of sin is death, he had to turn away from that. And by turning away from that, there was a separation. And Jesus felt that separation. And that's why he said, my God, my God, why have you abandoned me? And we, of course, we understand God didn't really abandon him. He just could not look upon his sin. In fact, he said many, as he said in the scriptures, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. Amen? Psalm 22, verses 1 to 3, is a further description of the agony of the cross. They say that that's what Jesus was, was uh, quoting when he was on the cross with Psalm 20, 22. It says, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why have you abandoned me? Why are you so far away when I groan for help? We're going to go to verse 3, 1, 2, and 3. Next verse. Every day I call to you, my God. Every day I call to you, God. But you do not answer. Have you ever felt that way? You pray and pray and pray. You're praying for a loved one. You're praying for someone to be saved. You're praying for someone to return back to God. And yet it seems like it's unanswered. How long did it take for your brother? Twenty-five years. Every night you hear my voice, but I find no relief. Yet you are holy, enthroned on the praises of Israel. He still recognized who God was, even though he had those emotions and he had those feelings. You know, that's why some people say, well, I, I, I just hurt someone. I can't pray. Yes, you can. You're letting the feelings and the emotions overcome you. I can't pray right now. Yes, you can. Okay? Don't let those feelings and those emotions take you over. Uh, especially, I hear this sometimes. Uh, I almost didn't come to church today because I had a fight with my husband or my wife. I, I, didn't, I couldn't come. Uh, I couldn't come because, I, you know, my, my kids were acting up and, and I, I felt like I'm a hypocrite. No, that's the time you need to be here. Right? You need to put all that aside and, and get into the presence of God and begin to praise him and worship him. What does the Bible say? Put on the garment of, for the spirit of, and when you're under, under that spirit of heaviness, you don't feel like praising. You don't feel like being in church. You don't feel like well, we're not supposed to be going by feelings. We walk by faith, not by 
sight. And so we have to continue pressing through that. I want to just touch on one more thing. Jesus said that there was no one greater than John the Baptist. Right? I mean, he leaped in the womb when Mary came near Elizabeth. There was a connection between him and Jesus. He was the forerunner that was prophesied that would come and announce the Lord. He was a man of God. He was a prophet. He was out in the desert eating honey and wild locusts. Camel hair, or whatever kind of hair that outfit was he, he wore. Out in the desert, people were flocking to him to hear the word of God. Along with his adversaries. Until finally he hit a nerve. And can I tell you, that's going to happen again in our time. Okay? Because people that speak the truth are going to hit a nerve politically. John the Baptist hit a nerve politically when Herod had his brother's wife. And John the Baptist said, it's not lawful for you to do that, what you're doing. He brought accountability to someone in public office. He was arrested. He was placed in jail. Okay. Now he's in jail. He's praying. And then he hears about Jesus. The blind are seeing, the lame are walking, the deaf are hearing. And he says, go see, go see if he's the one. And Jesus tells a, one of his disciples, go back and tell John that I am he. And here's John saying, great, the deliverer, the Messiah, it's him. He's here. And all of a sudden, a God comes in, takes John, cuts his head off. But I want you to understand that John the Baptist was a human being too. We don't know his emotional feelings or what he was going through at that time. We don't know as he was, his head was being placed on that block to have his head cut off, what he was thinking. That's why it's so important to deal with our feelings and our emotions. And don't let them dictate to you your true worth of who you are in God. I'm not talking about in and of ourselves. There's nothing good in us. The heart is wicked above all things. Who can know it? There's nothing. There's no good, the Bible says. No, not one. So I'm not talking about goodness that's in you. I'm talking about he that begun the good work in you shall complete it. That kind of work, of that kind of, of worth that God has invested in you, that you're not a nobody. You, you do count in the God's kingdom. You do count in the economy of God. You do count for the future of what God has and what God's plans are in your life. Don't ever feel that way. Don't ever feel like you're invisible. Because you're not. You will be noticed by those who God wants you to be noticed by. And it doesn't matter if they don't notice you. It doesn't matter. As long as you know that God notices you. And that God cares about you. The Bible says, I've not seen the righteous forsaken or his seed out begging for bread. 
So be blessed. And don't let any feelings of abandonment or things that have happened in your life dictate to you who you are as a person. You're not that person. I know it's a pretty shaky movie if you watch it on different channels. If you watch it on some channels, it's really can be bad language. But on the like TNT and stuff like that, where they blot out the bad language. There's a movie called Goodwill Hunting with John Damon. I think that's his name, Matt Damon. Goodwill Hunting, and he he has to go to a psychologist for help because he has some anger issues. He used to beat people up. Okay, and he had a very high IQ. Is one of the is like a genius. Well, toward the end of the counseling, it got to the end. This is a very powerful scene. And uh, Robin Williams was the, was the counselor. And he's talking to Matt Damon, and, he's, and he says, um, I just want you to know one thing, that those things that happened to you, he was burned with cigarettes, he was really mistreated as a child. And that's why he was acting out in anger. And, and uh, he said to him, he says, he said, um, Matt, just one thing I want you to know before you go to the effect says it's not your fault. And he said, Yeah, I know. And he goes, No. It's not your fault. And he goes, Yeah, I know. And he goes, It's not your fault. And he goes, What are you doing? And he goes, It's not your fault. And he says, Don't do this to me. And he goes, It's not your fault. And he pushes him away. No, not you, not you. He says, it's not your fault. Then he breaks down and he says, I'm sorry. He puts his arms around him. And he just starts weeping and weeping and weeping. And that was the breakthrough for him at that moment. And he finally received that, that it was not his fault why he went through what he went through, why he was burned with the cigarettes, why he did all those things, while he, you know, why his father mistreated him. His mother mistreated him, or I forget which one it was, but whoever it was that mistreated him, that it was not his fault. And that's where the healing comes from. So when you've, if you've gone through any of these things, anyone that's watching, you've gone through these things, people have mistreated you, misjudged you, whatever it may be, it's not your fault. Let's pray. Father, we thank you and we praise you for tonight. And I pray, God, that you will, by your Spirit, Bring healing and bring soothing to the wounds that people have felt through abandonment. When I say abandonment, I mean people leaving them, relationships leaving, things leaving them, whatever it may be that has left them and, and they felt like they were alone and felt abandoned. Lord, I thank you for healing those that came forward and maybe even those that sat back and didn't want to come forward. I thank you for your healing power, Lord, and your love. Thank you for healing me in many areas, Lord, of my life, and how you continually are healing me and delivering me to be a better person, a better husband, a better pastor, a better friend, a better brother. And I thank you, Lord. I pray that you give us traveling mercies. Be with us until we meet again. Be with Sunday morning service, Lord, and bless the, the musicians, uh, uh, the song leader. Bless the uh, preacher. He'll be here. Bless my flight as I go to Phoenix for that funeral, Lord. And I pray that, Lord, you would use me to be a blessing to them that are there. Give us traveling mercies there and back home, Father, while we're there. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless.